Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. I'm thrilled to be here with David Crew, who's going to be talking with us about the big dig. And um, <laughs> I know he, we all, all have lots of thoughts on it. So um, before we get to that, I just want to say a couple things. One, I want to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programming and also to the Tewksbury Library who have partnered with us on this program. So um, welcome everybody from everywhere but I'm very glad that you found us today. Um, I will be recording and sending out a recap with the recording link afterwards and maybe some interesting factoids afterwards because last time that's what we had to do because <laughs> the audience was so engaged in the conversation. So um, anyways, today, like I said, we're here talking about the big dig with David Crew. And I feel like he's like the best person to talk about it because he was actually a spokesman and webmaster for the big dig. Uh, back in the day, he's done many, many things. He's been a copywriter, computer programmer, radio producer, radio engineer, and like I said, a webmaster for the big dig. He's been retired for a while. He's actually been doing these talks. Um, and he's an author. I mean, I just, you're like the Renaissance man, David. I don't even know like what else to say. So welcome. Thank you so much again for doing this amazing program with us. This is our third or fourth, and I hope everybody has a great time. I do want to say, Feel free to chat away in the chat. If you have questions, though, we'll be taking them after David's presentation in the Q&A. There's a Q&A button along the bottom of the Zoom screen. Click on that and you can ask any question and I'll try to get to as many as possible um, after David's presentation. So welcome, David. Let's get started. Thank you, Mina. And hello, everybody. I see we got a lot of folks online with us and uh, not just from the Massachusetts area. So uh, thanks for joining us. So yeah, I was at the Big Dig for about three and a half years uh, in the 1990s. And I, it was a great gig. And I'll show you some pictures that I took while I was on the project. One of the things I didn't like about it was we had to keep all of our answers very concise. They wanted sound bites so they could get on the television, radio, or in the newspapers. But to me, the story about the big dig it takes a lot longer than just a soundbite to explain how did Boston get to the point where I, I believe it actually needed a big dig. So let's start off way at the beginning. In 1630, when John Winthrop and his hardy band of 30 settlers looking for fresh water came over here to the Shawmut Peninsula. Now, the only way they could get to the mainland of Massachusetts was through that narrow neck, and they built a small road, which is called Orange Street. After the revolution, it was renamed Washington Street. And what they needed were ferries so they could get across to Cambridge and Charlestown and South Boston. And ferries are great, but they take a lot of time to load and unload. It's expensive to run them. And of course, you've got weather problems. So in 1720, a town meeting was held so they could decide where to build a bridge. And to show you how little things have changed in Boston, there was a debate over funding and siting of this bridge, so nothing got done. And then in 1785, a group of privately funded bridges began to pop up in the Boston area. Starting in 17. 85. This one went across the Charles River to Cambridge from the west end of Boston. In 1805, another privately funded bridge went to South Boston. In fact, traffic across that Charles River bridge was so heavy that another West Boston bridge was built in 1809. And by the way, all of these bridges were extremely profitable. You were charged a toll depending upon how large a, a load that you were trying to carry over the river or across the cove. Now it's 1810, and the city hasn't grown substantially from its original size in 1640. But as we can see in this map from just a few years earlier, Boston is literally running out of room. The North End and the cent town center, they're crowded. Boston Common has been decreed out of bounds to developers. But there are these three hills known as the Tri-Mountains. There's Mount Vernon, there's Beacon, and there's Pemberton. So in 1799, a portion of Mount Vernon was leveled 
to build houses and the dirt was used to fill an extension of Charles Street. And in 1824, the mill pond was filled in using the top of Beacon Hill in a street pattern designed by Charles Bullfinch. And then as we can see in 1832, a man named Patrick Tracy Jackson, one of the founders of the textile mills in Lowell, he wanted to build a railroad station to ship and receive goods from his mills. So he takes the top off the last of the Tri Mountains, Cotton Hill, and he fills in new land around Causeway Street for that rail terminus. Meanwhile, he takes that now flat land where the dirt first came from and constructs a new neighborhood called Pemberton Square. And that is where Boston's elite lived for many decades. The biggest change that next happened to Boston was with the invention of those railroads. And in the 1830s and 1840s, they came from Lawrence and Lowell and Plymouth and Providence and more railroad stations were being built. More businesses were needed to support the trade and commerce and unemployment began to rise in Boston. The biggest change to the topography of Boston happened in the mid 1800s. Now, for many years, the Boston and Worcester Railroad ran across another dam called the Mill Dam, and it, it blocked off the Back Bay, which really was a bay. But in, that's what they called it. But in fact, it really was more like a smelly marsh. In fact, when they wanted, uh, they first wanted to build this mill dam after seeing how successful similar dams across Causeway Street were doing, uh, there was a lot of opposition. Uh, you'd call them uh, early proponents of, envi of the environment claimed that if you blocked off that bay or that marsh, you're going to get nothing but a big sewer. And to show you how little things have changed in Boston, it took the legislature late at night when only about one fifth of its members were in attendance to approve the project. Not only was the mill dam a financial failure, but by the late 1840s, the Back Bay literally bubbled with fermenting raw sewage. It was a 580 acre toilet in the middle of Boston. So a group of financiers got together and they proposed to fill in the back bay. Their biggest problem was, where are you going to get enough dirt and gravel to fill in 580 acres? We'd already torn down all the hills we could in Boston. So they had to come out here to the Needham Newton town line, utilizing two of the newest technologies, the steam engine and the steam shovel, which you can see in operation here. Three trains of 35 cars each made 16 trips every 24 hours for almost 30 years. And they took that smelly open marsh and by 1882, they had filled it in and created an entirely new neighborhood. So Boston, especially after the Civil War, when most of Southern United States was recovering from the Civil War, the North was just going gangbusters and Boston continued to grow. In 1887, uh, they electrified the city's streets and trolleys started to crowd the rail tracks that had been laid on the city's streets. The, the problem was there were so many trolley companies and so many routes that in 1895 it was reported it could take you one hour to go one block down Tremont Street riding one of those trolleys. Well the answer was to build the first subway in the United States and that work was begun in 1895. It was I guess you could call it our second big dig following the back bay. This picture is a classic example of what the engineers call cut and cover construction. So you route your traffic, you can see all those trolleys making that little S curve around that cut where they're building a one to 300 foot section 
of the underground train system. Then when they're done, they cut the next 300 feet, move the trolley tracks around, and they do that section by section. And this worked great. In 1897, Boston's uh, America's first subway system opened. It was such a rousing success that by 1898, they were extending it to other parts of the city. And everyone could get to work. And it, it was, uh, traffic was just, it was terrific. It was a breeze to go through Boston. And then some darn fool had to go and invent the automobile. And of course, everybody wanted to have one. And now there is traffic. So in 1909, a special city commission recommended to build a 100 foot wide roadway above a rail tunnel that would link north and south stations. Again, to show you how little things have changed in Boston, there were arguments over siting and funding, and it didn't get built. What did happen was that major thoroughfares such as Cambridge Street, as you can see here, uh, were being widened. Now, that didn't eliminate the traffic jams, it only made them wider. And now it's the Roaring Twenties, there's even more cars and more traffic. So in 1930, city planners proposed a dramatic and innovative idea. Let's build a 100 foot wide elevated highway between North and South stations. Now it would require a thousand businesses and residents to be taken, but that's not why it didn't get done because there was a little thing called the Great Depression. And then there was World War II. Very little got done here in the Boston area. The Sumner Tunnel opened in 1934 and was a smashing success, but it also put more cars on the streets. It's the classic, if you build it, they will come problem. Now it's after World War II and Boston is not doing well. Uh, one national newspaper would later describe the city as, quote, dying on the vine. Not only was there an exodus to the suburbs as people moved to the brand new Route 128, which is being built. James Michael Curley had been elected to his fourth and thankfully last administration where they continued to grant tax abatements and uh, there was no money for maintaining infrastructure, roads, safety services, schools, let alone in new civic construction projects. But then in 1948, the Federal Housing Act was passed and it would call for millions of dollars in federal funding for any city that would engage in slum clearance. Well, now there's a question. What's the definition of a slum? In Boston, it was the West End, Boston's most crowded but politically disconnected ward. Herbert Gans, he wrote that the neighborhood may have been crowded and lacking certain amenities, but it was not the definition of a slum. And, and when they tore it down, it was an unmitigated urban renewal disaster. Most former residents who were poor and had little political clout ended up in more expensive housing that taxed their resources to the limit. I'm mentioning the West End because this tragedy had a tremendous impact on the way the Big Dig project would operate. Now, John Collins gets elected mayor in 1959. He hires a city planner, a guy named Ed Logue, who engineers $40 million in federal and state funding for raising Scully Square and building government center. Now, unlike the West End disaster, there were few residents in the square, so the project was well received. Collins also proceeded with a plan to turn the Back Bay Rail Yard into the Prudential Center, as well as the South End Streets project and other jobs but traffic was still a problem. The 1948 McGuire plan proposed an innovative solution. You know what it was? You guessed it. Let's build an elevated highway from North to South Station. Well, government and private businesses, they were all for this project, but the North Enders said, absolutely not. It was still going to take thousands of homes, destroy businesses, so arguments began going back and forth on siting. Some people suggested that they move the elevated highway near the waterfront. After all, there already was 
the Atlantic Avenue elevated, which ran across that area, but it was rejected because the city planners said it would not achieve the main goal, which is to bring people into the city, not around it. So with state funding and a new mayor, Johnny Hines, it was decided to finally build that elevated highway. And in 1951, a large part of the North End, Boston's oldest neighborhood, was literally wiped off the face of the map. And bit by bit, the new elevated artery began to rise over that swath of land. 20,000 people would eventually lose their homes and businesses. Now, by 1954, the elevated highway had made its way here to the Fort Hill section. And they opened up that portion of the highway and we immediately realized several things about this highway. One, it was ugly. Two, it was a barrier between the neighborhoods. Three, the land underneath it, frankly, was not very useful. It's only good for parking and muggings. And the traffic flow was very confusing and very inefficient. And there were arguments, believe it or not, they wondered whether to even finish this job. Well. It was agreed that they would, but the southern part of the route was in great question. Francis Dahl, who was a uh, cartoonist for the old Boston Post, he had some great fun with the question as the Boston Board of Street Commissioners went to their founder, that alleged cow that wandered and made our streets, if you were only here to tell us what to do. Well, in late 1954, they decided to send the elevated highway through Chinatown and the Leather District. And then something really interesting happened. Chinatown, with help from businesses and the city, stopped the concrete onslaught from destroying their neighborhood. It was the beginning of neighborhood community activism, and it would affect all of Boston's public works projects through and passed the big dig. In 1956, the DPW relented. They'd still build that, that highway, but they'd put it underground. And the Dewey Square or South Station Tunnel, we can see being constructed in the classic cut and cover method. Now, it still required removal of buildings and streets, and it left a wide boulevard between Chinatown and the Leather District. So the neighborhood was still split, but it was the beginning. Now, the artery to Braintree would open on July 1st, 1959. And this was the ceremony they held uh, ribbon cutting on June 25th of 1959. Five days after this ceremony and a day before the central artery opened, the old colony railroad was shut down. We had made our choice. It was the highway, or no way to get into Boston from the South Shore. 75,000 vehicles a day used the highway in 1959. There were 27 on and off ramps, which were thought to be essential to prevent traffic from overwhelming the surface streets. The problem is that some knucklehead put the off ramp and the on ramp before the off ramp. And so you had these terrible weaves up there on the um, up there on the elevated road. Also, since the road was funded entirely by the state, they could only build six lanes. There was no money or room to build breakdown lanes. So let me ask you: out of seventy-five vehicles a day, what are the odds that one of them is gonna break down? But the DPW had a great solution, build more highways. This is the Witten plant, a regional spoke and wheel system that was planned in the era when automobiles were considered to be the answer to everybody's problems. So we have uh, going uh, clockwise, counterclockwise, I'm sorry, clockwise, yes, Southeast Expressway, I-95 south of the city, the Massachusetts Turnpike, Route 2 would be expanded into a fully divided highway, I-93 and I-95 north of the city. But remember, and also in the center of all of this was something called the Inner Beltway. That was an eight-lane elevated highway 
that would start off of the artery north of the city, sweep through Cambridge, down across the Charles River, through the Melniacast Boulevard area, and connecting up with I-93 or uh, the Southeast Expressway. But remember the West End? Remember what happened with Chinatown? As community activism and environmental protests began to be raised over the idea of trying to bring more cars into the area, one by one, these projects were taken off the books. So I-95 north of the city, the Route 2 expansion, the Southwest Expressway, and most importantly, the Inner Beltway were not built. So without the Inner Beltway, the Central Artery not only got traffic going into the city, but through it. And in the early 70s, the Mass Turnpike extension would connect to the southern end of the artery, and I-93 would connect to the Central Artery, creating the infamous three-lane weave from Starra Drive and the Tobin Bridge. How much fun was this? You'd be coming from Starra Drive and you wanted to go to the Tobin Bridge. So with traffic moving north on the artery, you had about 300 feet of elevated road in order to make that weave. It was the worst bottleneck in the state. Now, Folks, I have no documentation, no proof of the following, but I believe it is up there where the term mass hole was invented. I'm sorry, I think that's funny. Okay, but look, that meant the artery was congested. And by the 1970s, there were 190,000 cars a day. It's bumper to bumper traffic for six to eight hours every day. And the prediction was there'd be four, 15 to 16 hour traffic jams by 2010. The accident rate was four times the national average and it was deteriorating. And again, it was ugly. So how do you fix it? Well, one idea was to build a third Harbor Tunnel to bleed off traffic coming from the South. But this was a very interesting era because there were mothers in East Boston who were laying down in front of tractors and bulldozers, preventing Massport from building a new runway. So protests prevented that Third Harbor Tunnel from being built. So there were lots of other suggestions, something called the Levert Connector, which would put the Starra Drive connecting directly to the Tobin Bridge to fix that weave. But that was killed by John Sears and folks on Beacon Hill. There are proposals for a second deck, new ramps to East Boston Tunnel. Everything was rejected. You, you can't widen it. It's too expensive. And it's impossible after the West End or the South End streets. You can't take any homes or businesses to get this thing done. And then someone has an idea. Fred Salvucci, Secretary of Transportation under Mike Dukakis, had a proposal to replace the existing roadway with a tunnel. That would alleviate traffic congestion, allow Boston to reconnect the city with its waterfront. The problem was you can't shut the city down while you're doing this. But there was an engineer, a friend of Fred Salvucci's, a guy named Bill Reynolds, who said it was possible, but, well, it was going to be a little expensive. Get ready, folks. It was going to cost a whole $300 million to, okay, you can stop laughing now. Not a single dollar of this was going to qualify for federal funds, and this is $300 million in the 1970s. In fact, that was so much money back then that Barney Frank, who was then a state representative, said, it would just be easier and cheaper to raise the city than lower the artery. Now, in all fairness, the depression was really only for a section between Dewey Square and Government Center, and much of it would be like the turnpike extension is today, what they call a boat section. That's open, no roof, a couple of cross highways, but not needing expensive ventilation. The construction would also be nowhere near as sophisticated as the artery job eventually was. There was a 1982 proposal dumping airport onto traffic property on Bird Island Flats. 
another idea, another placement of the Third Harbor Tunnel. But Dukakis didn't want a Third Harbor Tunnel. He wanted to depress the central artery. Well, what happened in 1982 is that a fellow named Ed King got elected governor. And Ed King is the former director of Massport. And Ed King said, I don't want to depress the central artery. We need a third harbor tunnel. We need to get more people to the airport. And so there's the proposal that sat on the, uh, on the table for four more years. And what happened in 1986? Ed King voted out of office. Mike Dukakis gets back in and he says, I don't want to build a third harbor tunnel. I want to depress the central artery. Well, the answer was, and it's, of course, the, uh, Fred Salvucci, who I love, but it's a classic liberal solution. Let's do it all. I mean, the labor unions loved it. They loved the jobs. The environmentalists loved it because there's going to be green space and a promised rail link between North and South Station. The neighborhoods, they loved the commitment not to take any homes or businesses. And the businesses loved it because there was a commitment to keep every road operating until its replacement or temporary fix was in place. And it was Bill Reynolds who came up with this remarkably simple route for the tunnel to Logan. One that didn't require either going up the Fort Point Channel, but across a railroad right of way in the, well, we used to call it South Boston, uh, the South Boston Seaport, which back then was a desert, except for the uh, a restaurant and I think the Channel Nightclub and a bunch of parking lots. That's all you had back then. Plus, the Central Artery Project is then conceived would add one lane in each direction. Well, the federal government, the Federal Highway Administration, agreed to funding and the EIS. This, folks, is a really important document. It's the Environmental Impact Statement. It's basically the contract between the state and the federal government stating how the project would be built. And all those commitments, not take any homes, not take any businesses, keep every lane of traffic rolling, even during construction. So, in 1987, the Senate voted to fund the project. Ronald Reagan said, and I'll, I don't do very many impressions, but I love, here's one. He said, I haven't seen this much pork since I handed out blue ribbons at the Iowa County Fair. And he vetoed it. Now, what do you take? What do you need to override a presidential veto? Well, you need a two thirds vote in the Senate. And they had like 65 votes, 66 votes. They needed one more vote. So our, one of our senators, Ted Kennedy, gets one of North Carolina's senators, a guy named Terry Sanford, and they bring him into the old cloakroom and said, tell you what, Terry, old boy, you vote for our little project and we'll vote for your tobacco subsidies. And next thing you know, the project has been approved. Now we go into planning. And the state makes one decision that was universally admired, which is they accepted the fact that this project was way too large and way too complex for the state's DPW. So the Bechtel Company and Parsons Brinkerhoff were selected as joint managers of the project in, uh, late, in the late 1980s. Now we can start doing some building. Now, one of those things in that EIS, folks, was the commitment to minimize the impact to homes and businesses. In downtown Boston, there was a lot of mapping and moving of utility cables, pipes, and wires that have to be routed under, over, and around the new tunnel. Uh, there were also archaeological digs required by the federal, go federal government. If they were digging and somebody found a, a clay pipe or an old privy, they had to stop construction. The archaeologists come in and they actually found some pretty cool stuff and unearthed some really interesting history while doing it. They also had to figure out where to put the 13 million cubic yards of dirt and clay that were going to come out of the ground. One million of them would go to a place called Spectacle Island, 
a former dumping ground that was leaching contaminants into the harbor. So while all this is going on in downtown Boston, 12 binocular-shaped steel tubes were being built in a shipyard down in Baltimore. And between 1992 and 1993, they were barged up here. Each one of them is uh, about 40 feet in diameter and a little over 300 feet long. They were hoisted into place with these, this catamaran using satellites and laser beams. They would lower the tunnels into a ditch that was being dug between the airport and South Boston. With each, as each sections were pushed together, they would remove the, um, the, the uh, blocking between the two sections. Hydrostatic pressure literally pushes the sections together. And before you know it, you have a three quarter mile long tunnel going from South Boston to the airport. These are thousand pound ceiling tiles being put into place in the tunnel. Why so heavy? Because fresh air is being pumped in through the floor and exhaust being pulled out through the ceiling tiles. And when traffic was really heavy, you're looking at uh, wind that is moving at about 40 miles an hour. So those tiles had to be nice and heavy to stay into place. On the walls of the tunnel, millions of tiles, each individually placed. This is one of those fan buildings. The Ted Williams Tunnel ultimately would be one and a half miles long. That includes the land-based approaches in both South Boston and at Logan Airport. There's a computerized traffic monitoring system and an emergency response station that is also located here at the South Boston building. December 15th, 1995. This is a really cool day for me because I got to meet Ted Williams and a few other baseball stars like Ralph Kiner uh, when we opened the first major portion of the big dig, which was the Ted Williams tunnel. So while Work was being finished up here in the Ted, now named Ted Williams Tunnel. Work is beginning downtown and in other sections of the highway. Up here at Logan Airport, a $2 billion job paid for by Big Dig Money would connect the Ted Williams Tunnel with Route 1A and airport roadways. It would also take, if you notice, on the right side of where that ball field and football stadium are, it would move that approach and exit from the airport to the tunnel to the Sumner and Callahan over on the other side, reconnecting that park with the East Boston neighborhood. Meanwhile, in South Boston, the Ted Williams Tunnel would be connected with the Massachusetts Turnpike, and this was going to be quite a job. This is a um, one of the plans for the eventual alignment of the Ted Williams Tunnel. So in blue is tunnel, in green is elevated roadway, in orange is what we described as the boat section. That's the tunnel, but there's no roof to it. And the yellow are um, transitional spaces where you're going from elevated to underground or underground to elevated. Um, basically, it's what the way this was described to me was it was taking a standard four leaf clover, the over uh, the uh, overpasses that you normally see like at 93 and 128, because you had Chinatown in the upper left-hand corner, the South End streets in the lower left-hand corner, and you had the Fort Point Channel on the lower right-hand corner. The only place you could build those four clover leaves was in the upper right-hand corner. You're basically like an omelet, the way it was described to me, folding over three sections on top of each other to make the connection between the Ted Williams Tunnel and the underground central artery. Complicating this were a few other problems, like the fact that originally we were gonna build the Ted Williams Tunnel. It was gonna come out from South Boston and go elevated and go over the South Expressway and down into the boat section of the Massachusetts Turnpike. But the 
Gillette Corporation, which was the second, if not the largest employer in the state, was not very happy that we were going to take their parking lot from them. So that's when they had to figure out how to build a tunnel from the Ted Williams Tunnel under the Fort Point Channel and then connecting up with the, uh, the Massachusetts Turnpike and the Southeast Expressway. And they did that, it's extraordinarily clever, by building sections of the tunnel here in these casting basins. And inside each this casting basin, three different sections of tunnel were built and then floated into the harbor and connected with the Massachusetts Turnpike, an extraordinarily complex part of the project. Complicating this was the fact that we had eight train tracks that leave South Station, and that's not including the one for the Acela. Again, let's go back to that EIS. You're not allowed to take a single lane of traffic or a train track. So how do you build a tunnel under nine active rail lines. The answer was to borrow some technology from the Brits. It's called tunnel jacking. This is a pretty descriptive uh, cross section showing you how that tunnel section was built first in this trench next to those railroad tracks. And then over on the left side, you see a hydraulic jack. It's extremely powerful. And as on the far right side, the dirt from underneath those tracks is being dug away and carried off by uh, conveyor belts, the jack slowly pushes the tunnel forward a few inches at a time. It sounds wild, but here it is. That's that section of tunnel being slowly jacked underneath those active rail lines. Oh, and, and did I mention that the soil here around the South Station area was the consistency, and this is a quote, of weak old tapioca. And apparently, you, you can't build in weak old tapioca. So how do you stiffen up the soil? Well, normally, if you were in an area where you had lots of elbow room, you do something called uh, a grouting. And it's kind of like the stuff you have in your bathroom tiles. It's grout and you mix it into the ground and it hardens soft soil and lets you dig through it. Problem is, there's not enough room to do that here behind the South Station. You've got the Southeast Expressway, you've got the, um, uh, you've got, uh, the railroad lines. So what they did was they injected freezing brine into the ground using that to stiffen the soil, and that's how they're able to dig out for the tunnel jacking. Well, we finally come to the heart, no pun intended, of the Central Artery Tunnel Project. The work that was being performed downtown to replace the six lane elevated highway. And again, I need to remind you about the West End and about the North End and about Boston and as you know, we have very long memories in this town. And so uh, there was no way that project could continue if there was a threat of even one home or one business or one lane of traffic being taken. So that's when I learned a new word. I'd never known what the word mitigation was, and I had to look it up. And it actually says to make less painful. And there's a great quote, I wish I had written it, which was uh, used by our project director when he was being interviewed by 60 Minutes in 1996, which was what we're doing, or what we were doing, was not unlike performing open heart surgery on a patient who insists on going to work every day and playing a round of tennis. That's why one of the reasons why the project's costs were so high, because big pieces of equipment like this one need lots of room, but we were penning them up and forcing uh, construction to work in much smaller areas, meaning it was going to take more time. 
the biggest challenge, of course, was how do you keep the elevated highway operating and the surface streets open while building an elevated roadway directly over where that tunnel is going to be? The underpinning was a key to the big dig, and it's a refinement of the original Bill Reynolds idea. So um, we're seeing going down into the ground from the surface what are called slurry walls. And I'll talk to you about what those are, but they're basically building concrete walls underground. Then you build, you put in steel I-beams in between those, um, those slurry walls. Then another cross beam between those two I-beams and you it's called jacking. I know we have tunnel jacking. Now we have elevated artery jacking. You gently and carefully elevate the artery by maybe an inch or two, just enough to slide those cross beams in and build a support system. And now look, your artery is now sitting on top of a bunch of cross beams, which then have their force going into the slurry walls, which go down 100 feet into the bedrock. And this was the key. This was the way to get the Big Dig project done. Slurry walls, as I say, um, are slurry is a very thick, viscous material. And as you dig your uh, channel, your your um, down into the ground, you're pouring this slurry into the ground, and that prevents the dirt from falling into your dig. And you do that, and when you're done. You lower in a steel cage so that when you then pour in your concrete, you have a steel reinforced slurry wall sitting underground. Here's a picture of uh, one of those slurry walls and one of those section of the artery that has been jacked and then lowered to sit on top of those I-beams. <laughs> this is a pretty cool picture. There were 26,000 linear feet of slurry walls. That's about five miles worth. And they were put in one 10 foot trench at a time. Uh, concrete decking was placed across those roof beams. And as traffic moved along above all the, uh, the, the open space, they were digging a tunnel. Uh, I can tell you that that is genuine Boston blue clay. It does not come out of your clothes very easily. Um, and uh, it's, um, it, it was really, really something to be down into this cut and to see all of this activity going on, knowing that just above you, just above those beams, Boston is just carrying on with its daily routine. Millions of tiles, each individually hand-placed were eventually put on the wall. Uh, here at South Station, they had the extra complexity of building the northbound lanes, not only underneath the Red Line subway, but also building the new transitway, the new Silver Line, which would go to South Boston. Now, let's talk about this thing. Uh, my first state before I proceed that I really admire Fred Salvucci. Uh, he's a, 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 a brilliant engineer and a brilliant politician. And uh, he actually attended one of my lectures and he, 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 I won't say chastised, but he took a little bit of offense at how I, I, I worded the selection of this. Because even to this day, Fred Salvucci defends his choice of scheme Z as a way to connect the Central Artery, Starro Drive, and the Tobin Bridge. See. This alignment would require people to make, if you're coming north on the artery and you want to go to Starro Drive, you had to go over the Charles River, go around those loop ramps, and go back over the river. Conversely, if you're on Starro Drive and you want to go south on the artery, you had to make the exact opposite trip. It would require an elevated uh, interchange, which would be about 10 stories high, uh, the EPA called it, quote, the single ugliest structure in New England. Uh, the Charlestown neighborhood hated it, hated it, hated it. 
uh, Cambridge folks, they weren't too happy with it either. There were threats of lawsuits from Cambridge and the Sierra Club. And in 1991, it became someone else's problem anyway, because William Weld came into office and he brought the community, the environmentalists and the activists to the table, along with the Mass Highway Department and Bechtel Parsons. And they came up with this. See, to make a direct connection between Starro Drive and the Tobin Bridge, you have to have tunnels. Um, uh, topology is a level of math I don't get. I but uh, somebody showed me how it would. It just you either do that double cross, or you spend the money to build the tunnels. And that was uh, Fred Salvucci's main argument to me that given the cost constraints, the double crossing scheme Z was at the time about a four hundred million dollar project. Once you said we're not going to do scheme Z. We're going to have direct connections between Starro Drive and the artery underground. It means you build tunnels, and now your section of this section of the project becomes closer to one to one and a half billion. To get across the Charles River now from underground to where the existing double decker, upper and lower deck are, would now require a very special kind of bridge. Charlestown, turns out, was the very first to see the benefit of the Underground Highway. Uh, maybe many of you remember what it was like when the off-ramp and on-ramp from the Tobin Bridge came directly over City Square, where it connected up to that hellacious double weave uh, above the Charles River. But in uh, 1996, when the temporary loop ramps were built to accommodate the new alignment for the new, uh, 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 the new connection between Starro 93 and, and the underground artery, they were able to take down the elevated highway and open up Charlestown and give them this new public park. To make this all work required a very special bridge. It required fewer piers that would impede Charles River traffic. You had to, the, it doesn't look very dramatic, but that's a pretty dramatic uh, grading for a bridge. What it required was something called a cable stayed bridge. Obviously it's stunning. It's also kind of groundbreaking here in Boston. It's the first hybrid cable stayed bridge in the United States has both steel and concrete in its frame. And um, to build it while not taking down and uh, any of the double decker, you can see required a very ingenious series of staging process, uh, for making that connection between the bridge and the underground artery. I mean, it, it's, it's a stunning bridge. And even before completion, it had became a symbol exploited by banks and newspapers and even a jewelry store. Um, and finally, beam by beam, bent by bent, the old elevated road was taken down, leaving open the promised 30 acres of land. Now, the EIS, the, that environmental impact statement, back to it now, it said that 75% of the land that would be revealed by putting the artery underground would be open space. Well, what's the definition of open space? Some say that open space like this is as bad as the elevated artery for dividing the city. So what do you put there? Stores, restaurants, housing, playgrounds, fountains, museums. How do you create a space, first of all, that's fair, because a lot of people lost a lot of homes and businesses back in the early 50s, but create a place that people want to visit, not just pass through. Um, I'm seeing I'm running against time. I want to make sure I have time for questions. Uh, yeah, they had some problems. They had a little leaky problem. And you know why they had a leaky problem? Because in order to keep the costs down, instead of two slurry walls, they only had one slurry wall. And given that Boston is basically built on fill and it's really wet underground, when you get down to 100 feet, it's really wet. 
they had to spend a few years plugging up a lot of the holes that showed up in that slurry wall. There were some tragedies as well. Um, in July 2006, Milena Diwali and her husband were driving to the airport when a ceiling tile fell on their car in South Boston. Now, we came to learn that this ceiling tile, which, as I told you earlier, there are a thousand or more pounds of piece, it had been fastened to the ceiling with glue, which was a cost saving measure by the contract. Her family filed and won a lawsuit against Powers Fasteners and many others, including the Turnpike Authority. Um, Governor Mitt Romney was not hearing it from Matt Amarello, who was then the project director, but wasn't the project director very much longer. Construction on the highway is done, but uh, related construction continues. That Green Line extension we've all heard so much about that goes from uh, Leachmere all the way into uh, Medford is part of the big dig mitigation to get people, it's ironic, we build a highway and then we are trying to get people off the highway by providing better mass transit solutions. So the big question, did it work? Well, it's hard to say, uh, especially with the impact of the pandemic. Uh, we do know that travel time before the pandemic from I-93, uh, uh, sorry, from Boston up to uh, 128, absolutely almost doubled in the years following the completion of the Big Dig. But it did work if you claim, that if you're looking for the progress in downtown where you can see traffic drop by almost 66% the time it took to travel through Boston thanks to the tunnel. Fred Salvucci, the man behind the big dig for better or worse, he once said to WBZ Radio, quote, I get a real kick out of the fact that they've had to put up 35 mile an hour speed limits on the underground part of the artery because it's now possible to go too fast. It didn't used to be possible to speed. And any of you like me who are on this, who had to drive through Boston, you know that's to be true. All right, um, folks, I tried to get through 375 years as quickly as I could. So I'll now turn it back to Mina and uh, I guess we'll take your questions. Let me turn my video back on. Hello. Hi, hey. that was amazing. Thank you, thank you very <laughs> I'm much. I'm seeing in the chat that people are thinking this is unbelievable information and so fascinating. Um, so do you want to turn your, uh, stop sharing your screen, Dave? Yes. Hold on, folks. I can do this. <laughs> hold it, hold it. Okay. Okay. So I am recording this. I will send the video out to everybody who's registered. Nancy had asked, but... Um, I'm very glad, David, that you spoke about mass holes. I always wondered where that <laughs> came from. <laughs> and I also think that's hilarious. Well. Um, <laughs> it makes sense that it would come from the, the Big Dig, which was such a production. Yeah, um, so let's get right into some questions. So Faye asks, were there liability issues for the private funders of public bridges? And who is responsible for construction oversight? This is early well, on the question. Yeah, uh, so that would be, uh, we're talking back in the 1700s and 1800s. And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, people were, I don't think were as litigious uh, back then. So I don't think that was a concern. Their main job was just to, to keep the, the bridges open and to okay. collect their fee. <laughs> Sherry responds that now it's, we're called Mass Holians. <laughs> so, you know, there's been some evolution there. <laughs> um, so, and Lois asks, wasn't there a village of black and brown residents in West Newton uprooted to build the Mass Pike? Do you know what year that was? So the Mass Pike extension was completed in the very early 70s. So the answer to that question would come from uh, the man whom, with whom I collaborated on a book about um, Route 128. His name is Yanni Sippis, and he wrote a book about the Mass Turnpike, and it, it might be in there. I'd have to actually look at my copy. So I don't know. It's possible. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, and I had the same question, has that glue problem been fixed? 
Yes. What did they do? Um, well, in some cases, they they replaced the glue with um, the proper method, which a proper method, which is to um, uh, attach physically attach with um, high pressure, uh, like nail guns, mm -hmm. but a little more sophisticated than that, since we're talking about, you know, several thousand pounds of uh, weight. Mm -hmm. That's amazing that they made that decision. Mm -hmm. um, do city planners rely on best practices and best solutions from other cities, whether the USA or foreign? Stephen asks that. I'll answer it this way. In, in the 1990s, Seattle was faced with the very same problem that Boston was facing. They had an elevated roadway going along their waterfront. And like the in Central Artery here in Boston, they had a beautiful city that was cut through the through with that awful elevated road. They knew they were they were going to get rid of the elevated road. What they decided to do, looking across the country and seeing what was happening here, not only the cost, but the dirt, dust and, and issues is they just said, you know what, we're just going to we're going to just bring people onto the city streets. And what happens is. And this is the what the the um, the people who study traffic and study traffic patterns, and they figure out how people behave when presented with it's the you know not only if you build it they will come, but if you make it really difficult they will stay away. Mm -hmm. And Seattle said, you know what, we're getting rid of this elevated road and we're not going to build a replacement. And they didn't and people who want to go on the other side of Seattle and don't want to drive through the city, they just go around it. So we were a bit of a cautionary tale. Yes, yes. And also, um, you know, uh, it, it ended up, as everybody here is probably familiar, with the number 22 billion, which was ultimately the final cost of the project. And that that's a pretty scary number. Uh, so the, the cost also. And the federal government being a little less willing after our experience to just say, yeah, sure. You know, what do you need? Can you remind me what was the original cost estimate? So I'm going to answer the question as if I were still at the big dig. Um, and and I'm, I'm not hedging here. Look, in 1983, the original co uh, cost estimate for the project as then designed was 2.6 billion. Okay. But that was 1983. Project wasn't completed until 2003 so that's 30 years costs go up in 30 years the project itself again the fort point channel crossing can't go over because you can't you know the uh, uh, gillette said no you're not taking our parking lot gotta go under ka-ching there's an extra billion dollars mm -hmm. scheme z can't do that ka-ching there's another billion dollars um it's, so the costs start to go up mitigation issues about where you're going to exactly put a ramp and and what you can and cannot do the it, it and that's where costs just started to go up um so chris has a follow-up question to that part of um how much more did the commonwealth end up paying so the feds they turned off the spigot sometime in 90 98 or 99 so it was a it was a it was a few billions, uh, mm -hmm. but again, see the federal government and and anyone I I've given my one twenty eight talk I think to the group right yeah. so you know, whenever you have an I which means interstate that means the feds will they have to kick in for maintenance and and uh, and widenings and things like that so just based on the fact that this roadway through the center of Boston is an I it's a ninety three. Uh, allow them to still t still take some money from the Fed. So we weren't completely on the hook, but uh, and plus there was a lot of selling of bonds and and other ways of raising the money. Mm -hmm. It sounds very complex. It and, is. And um, you had mentioned that parking lot. So Nancy asked, wasn't there? Isn't what, couldn't they claim eminent domain to get that parking lot for Gillette? I think. Yeah, but do you really want to piss off the people who are who have 
14, and 14,000 employees. And, and another thing, um, the equipment that makes those razors in that location is so sensitive. Uh, and so the idea that <laughs> they're, they're jacking tunnels and digging out the ground and they're doing all this heavy, heavy work and yet Gillette was still able to operate at full capacity the mm -hmm. entire time. Again, mitigation folks, and that sound you hear is the sound of the cash register. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you've mentioned mitigation, Barb asks, what happened about mitigating the mouse and rat population? That was a that was a a product product of a journalist's fevered mind. Ooh. That was a load of crap. I'm sorry. It just was. It, it and and it 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 didn't happen. In fact, the, <laughs> it's so funny. We used to just, we used to bust his chops, but the, 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 rat, the rat man, the guy at the project whose job it was, uh, they actually solved a lot of problems uh, where people cooperated, like making sure they put lids on their, uh, their trash containers. So restaurants also were putting their trash in the right receptacles. Uh, the, the, the rat problem that I, I still remember that, uh, what was it, the Boston Magazine? This very dramatic drawing of the, uh, like a Pied Piper thing with millions of rats encroaching on the city. Oh, garbage. Crap. It was, Got it. Yeah, it was crap. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Somebody said that they heard that the elevated I-90 near BU is going to going to Cambridge will be lowered to the ground. Is that project going forward? Yeah, that's the, um, they call it the throat. I don't know where the hell that came from. Um, yes. Uh, and so much of what, you know, somebody, okay, this actually goes back to the question I asked before, what lessons were learned? So uh, lesson number one is uh, don't believe the estimate that you're telling him now in, in year one, because by year 10, because you're mitigating, because you still have to let get people. So yes, that that whole, it, and it, just an absurd interchange where the turnpike kind of does this weird circle around the Alston uh, landing area. But yes, they're gonna clean that up. And at the same time, they're gonna build another railroad station and uh, Harvard, which owns most of that land, they're basically, you know, they're encroaching, making their way over the river as they have been for many decades to uh, build more space. Mm -hmm. um, so Lois asks, uh, you, well, and you just mentioned railroads, that you mentioned they were closing. What year and to where did they close? And did this affect the employment of the railroad workers? Yeah, it did. The old colony was out of business. Mm -hmm. um, the B&M still ran north of the city. Uh, but, um, and by the way, mitigation, when the big, you know, the ramping back up of the South Shore rail lines, it's, it's, you know, not unlike many American cities that tore up trolley tracks in the 1950s, because, hey, we can all have cars. And then by the 70s, oh boy, traffic's really bad. Let's, and, and the pollution's bad and smog is bad. Let's get people into mass transit. Oh, Darn, we don't have any mass transit. So now they put back the rail line. And it's mm. the same thing there. It's it's um, the cost. And that, by the way, is also big, big money. It's mm -hmm. the, the Newburyport extension, the uh, uh, the uh, 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 one of the South Shore lines. I mean, it's actually two of the South Shore lines were part of that EIS. Interesting. Mm. Um, I'm just going to take a couple more questions. Um, sure. Stevens asks, um, did Robert Moses have any input or say in Boston? He was the godfather of New York City. Yeah, godfather um, is a good word to use because he really whacked a lot of people. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> read Robert Caro's The, the Power Broker. It's, it's a fascinating look at, uh, at, at a man who was both visionary uh, a visionary megalomaniac uh, who um, imposed that automobile first uh, uh, and automobile centric and also um, white middle class centric view of the world. And uh, it's, uh, you know, and I'm from New York, 
and I can tell you uh, the impacts of, uh, and I, my grandparents were from the Bronx, mm -hmm. and there's a thing called the Cross Bronx Expressway, which was one of those Moses projects that absolutely devastated uh, neighborhoods as they just, he just said, okay, we're, that I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And right. we're taking your homes and we're taking, and it, and by the way, I don't think I'd ever, I've ever been on the Cross Bronx Expressway when it wasn't bumper to bumper. Mm -hmm. Same. I've been there yeah, too. I just, I'm not a fan. He, yeah. he, he. Anyways, um, so Louise asks, um, what might be infrastructure issues today and what might, changes might be considered today? That, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Are there, I guess my my take on that is, are, are there any infrastructure uh, issues left from the big dig? And um, well, did, so uh, uh, anybody here ever, because right down somewhere over there is the intersection between 93 and 128. One of the worst intersections in the country because it is a cloverleaf. Mm -hmm. Cloverleafs were awesome back when cars only went 30 miles an hour and and cars were new and people were much more polite uh but now it's just it's it's awful you know mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a daily nightmare out there and even on the weekends people going to new hampshire or the cape or wherever so yeah there are there are big projects that could get done uh but i can tell you they've been talking since the early 2000s about what to do about that interchange but uh, again, we've we've kind of you know tapped out our uncle Sam. Hey, can we have some more money for this? No, go away. <laughs> you, you had enough money, right? So your allowance uh, is spent. <laughs> yeah. So you know. Oh my gosh. So I guess my last question is: Do you think that ultimately the big dig was um, successful? Yeah, I I I do, I do. The it repaired. It repaired a city. Um, it, it it did improve air quality. It did improve your travel time through the city. Um, and you know the adventure, <laughs> the technical uh, expertise uh, that was gained uh, is is being spread around the world. I mean, there are projects around the world where I'm sure the people, the things that were learned here uh, are being employed elsewhere. But I mean, uh, it's, it, of course, we all wish it didn't cost as much as it did, mm -hmm. uh, but the fact is it did. And uh, I, I, I still say it's, it's a better experience uh, when you have to drive uh, going through Boston. In that respect, I'd say it was a success. Okay, yeah, I mean, there's different, different ways measures of success for things too so that's that's a great answer so david thank you for doing this oh, again thank and you. Um, for those people still with us david's going to do another program with us in um i think we said october 6th i'll put it in the recap email on the yes. scully square mm -hmm. his, the history of scully square which i think is going to be really fascinating it's gonna be a lot of fun <laughs> i'm i have no doubt so thank you, David, for doing this. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you, everyone, for coming today. I, I'm going to I'm just going to take a look at the chats now. Yep. And um, I can send that to you as well. But thank you uh, for everybody for being here. And I hope you all have a wonderful summer. So can, good afternoon. Have a great weekend. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Enjoy. Bye, David. Bye bye.